Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Eastern Area Planning Committee, which is one of the three area based planning committees of Dorset Council. Our area of remit covers the previous Purbeck District Council and most of the East Dorset District Council areas. For the benefit of the public, I'm Councillor Tony Coombs and I'm chairman of this area planning committee. I would first of all like to introduce the officers who are supporting us today. We have Kim Cowell as Principal Planning Officer, Liz Adams, Planning Case Officer, Caroline Smith, Planning Case Officer, Lexi Donez, Planning Case Officer, Colin Graham from Dorset Highways, Chelsea College, who will be reading out the public representations, Phil Crowther is our Legal Support and David Northover, our Committee Support Officer. I would also like to thank all the officers behind the scenes who are making today's virtual meeting possible. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Council has had to put in place measures to enable the Council's decision making processes to continue whilst keeping safe members of the public, councillors and council staff in accordance with the government, government's guidance on social distancing by applying new regulations for holding committee meetings from remote locations. This meeting is being live streamed to the public and a copy of the recording of the meeting will be available on the website after the meeting. Public participation will take the form of written statements to the committee. Do we have any apologies for absence, please? No apologies received, Chairman. OK, thank you. Uh, as has become the norm. I'm going to do a roll call just to make sure that we have every member of the committee here and that it's transparent. So Shane Bartlett. Present, Madam Chairman. Alex Brenton. Present, Madam Chairman. Robin Cook. Present, Madam Chairman. Mike Dyer. Present, Madam Chairman. Barry Gorringe. Present, Madam Chairman. Brian Heatley. Present, Madam Chairman. David Morgan. Present, Madam Chairman. Glad you've made it. I'm Julie married. Robertson. Present, Madam Chairman. David Took. Present, Madam Chairman. Bill Trite. Present, Madam Chairman. And John Worth. Present, Madam Chairman. That's lovely. Good morning to you all. That's everybody here. Are there any declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, price or predetermination that's apparent at this stage? Uh, yes, Madam Chairman. Councillor Morgan. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. What's, what's the uh, details of your declaration? The details is that I was uh, until the end of last year a trustee of the Allendale Centre and I uh, still sit on the committee. So I think I've got, uh, as a planning committee member, I've obviously got an interest in the Allendale Centre. So it may be better if I uh, leave any speaking about it to my colleague, uh, Councillor Shane Bartlett, if he wants to speak about it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Oh, that's fine. And I've taken advice from, uh, uh, from legal, uh, legal this morning. That's right. And if you wish to speak, if you wish to speak, I will allow you to speak as a ward member, but you are not to take part in the debate. OK, that, that's understood, Madam Chairman. Lovely. Uh, Shane Bartlett, you also wish to say something. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, agenda item five, um, the Allendale Community Centre. Just for transparency, um, the Allendale Cafe is run by the Folk Festival Committee, of which I'm a member and the chairman of the Andel Centre as the trustees is also known to me as the chairman of the Folk Festival as well. But that's just for transparency and I believe I have the right to speak in the committee. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you. And you have taken legal advice on that? I have, thank you, yes. Yeah, thank you, that's fine. OK, so moving on to item three. Uh, we have the uh, little a is to confirm the revised minute 173 to the meeting held on, on the 10th of February this year. Uh, members will recall it came to the last meeting um, and issues were raised. I have since the agenda was 
has been published had uh, further correspondence with the local member and with officers and you should have had circulated immediately prior to the meeting a revised set of wording which picks up any remaining issues of um, any factual errors sorry um, so that has now oh thank you very much presentation presenter for sharing that. Um, so you now see on the screen um, the final revised minute which you have in front of you. Are members now happy to accept that as the minute for that meeting? Happy Madam Chair. Yeah, is, is there any dissent? Okay. No, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, OK, we will take that then as the confirmed revised minute. Thank you to everyone that's uh, been involved in that today. Little B are the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 10th of March. Are members happy to agree the minutes of the previous meeting? Agreed, Madam Chairman. Yeah. 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 Any dissent? Happy. No. OK, thank you all very much. Participation. Members of the public have been invited to submit written representations which are limited to 450 words and the maximum accepted are three under each category and are accepted in strict date and time order. Um, due to Easter I did extend the uh, time limit to yesterday morning at 9.30. Members of Dorset Council who are not members of the committee who wish to address the committee will also be allowed to speak to the committee and as I said all requests had to be registered nine yesterday. Are there any representations from the public that do not relate to matters on the agenda today? No chairman. Okay thank you. Okay, so we have two planning applications before us today. Have there been any requests for defers or withdrawals, please? Kim Cowell here, Madam Chairman. Thank you. There have been no requests for deferrals or withdrawals. Okay, thank you. So the background information relating to the planning applications has been available for inspection by members prior to the meeting and that covers consultations, objections and representations as well as the East Dorset and Purbit local plans and the council's related policy. Just so that everyone is aware of how we run the meeting, in each case I will invite the case officer to introduce their item, members of the public, planning agents, applicants, Town and Parish Councils have all been invited to make written submissions and these will be read out by Chelsea Gollidge. And just to confirm that she has not been involved with the merits of either of the applications, but only in providing technical support. The representations will be read out in the following order, public against, public support, the applicant or agent, the Town or Parish Council and then the local member. Following the public participation section of every item, I will ask the officers if there are any salient points that they wish to clarify or respond to. I will then um, turn to the members of the committee for questions and comments and the debate so that everyone has the opportunity to take part. Can I remind members of the committee that any remarks and questions must be directed through myself as chairman and I will invite members to speak in turn. Requests to speak need to be made via the chat facility and, and please only use the chat facility for that process because we do need to be transparent in how we operate. Please keep your microphones on mute when you're not uh, speaking so that we can maintain audio visual quality. And at the end of the debate, again for transparency, I will take the vote by roll call and the vote will be recorded in the minutes if three or more members make the necessary request. I will also ask members to confirm that they've heard the entire presentation and debate before they cast their vote. So we will now move on to the presentations and there may be a short gap while the first presentation is loaded and that is agenda item 5, 3 stroke 20, 2057, 
stroke FUL, replacement roof to existing building at Allendale Community Centre, Hannam Road, Wimble, Minster. And that starts on page 19 of your agenda. So Caroline Smith, you're going to take us through the presentation. Good morning, members. The application comes before members because the applicant is Dorset Council. There have been no third party objections. The Town Council have raised no objection. The Allendale Centre is a community centre building in Wimborne. The site is located in the centre of Wimborne. Former East Dorset members may be familiar with this building as the planning committee used to be held in part of the building known as the Court of Jack Suite. The building is detached and Caroline, has Caroline, I'm yes. sorry, can I interrupt? Can yeah. you put your presentation on screen, please? Ah, oh, sorry, I thought I had. Uh, uh, can you see the slide now? Um, no, we've got the agenda up. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Caroline, it's Megan producing. If you just share your screen, can I just make sure you're sharing your screen when you've got the presentation? Otherwise, uh, the members won't be able to see it. Uh, um, I think I'll have to unshare and start again. I do apologise. Um, Um, do you wish me to go back to the first slide? Um, yes, please. Sorry. Yeah. Are you now, now able to see the slide which says Dorset Council? We can. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> sorry about that. Good morning, members. The application comes before members because the applicant is Dorset Council. There have been no third party objections. The Town Council have raised no objection. The Allendale Centre is a community centre building in Wimborne. The site is located in the centre of Wimborne and former East Dorset members may be familiar with this building as the planning committee used to be held in part of the building known as the Court Jack Suite. The building is detached and it has a substantial footprint. It measures approximately 42 metres in depth and 47 metres in width with brick elevations. The community centre building is surrounded to the north and east by public car parking. Immediately to the east side of the building is the River Allen. Situated to the north and northwest of the building is residential development in Eastborough. The Allendale Community Centre building is set back approximately 40 metres from the Hannam Road frontage beyond a public garden. The building was constructed in the early 1970s. A central section accommodates the main hall and is equivalent to two storey in height with a metal seamed reef, roof. The remainder of the building is single storey in height with a flat roof. The use of the building falls within class F2B of the Town and Country Planning Use Classes Order, halls or meeting places for the principal use of the local community. The proposed new roof is required to waterproof the building. The existing roof is allowing water through, causing damage to the interior of the building. This slide shows a photo of the southern front elevation of the building and the drawing below it shows the proposed new roof with a shallow pitch. The proposal involves a modest increase in the height of the central part of the building 
from approximately 6.9 metres to 7.5 metres at its highest point. This slide shows a photo of the west elevation of the building. The drawing illustrates the proposed shallow pitched roof over the main section of the building and a modest canopy which wraps around the southwestern corner of the building. This slide shows the eastern elevation of the building facing the River Allen. This, this slide shows a photograph of the north elevation which faces a car park. The site lies within the urban area of Wimborne Minster and within Wimborne Minster Conservation Area. The community centre building, um, which I'm showing with a pointer on the slide, it's not list this is not listed, the, the, the Allendale Centre. To the southwest of the Allendale Centre, as I've shown by the pointer, is Allendale House a historic three-storey Grade 2 listed building which houses the East Dorset Heritage Trust. The Council's Conservation Officer was consulted and responded in support of the proposal on the basis that there would be no harm to the character and appearance of the conservation area, nor any harm to the significance of or to the setting of the listed building. The proposed development therefore accords with policy HE1 of the core strategy or local plan in that it protects the significance of the heritage asset and its setting. I'm just, sorry, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. This slide shows the relationship between Allendale House on the left and the Allendale Community Centre to the right side of the photograph. The northeast corner of Allendale House is situated approximately five metres from the southwest corner of the Allendale Community Centre building. This slide shows the southwest corner of the Allendale Community Centre and the northeast corner of the historic Allendale House. The existing roof to the northwest element of the building, known as the Quarter Jack Suite, is to remain unaltered. This element of the building is the part of the building situated closest to the nearby residential development in Eastborough. As there would be no change to the roof of the Quarter Jack Suite, there would be no adverse impact upon the amenity of occupants of the properties in Eastborough. The proposal therefore accords with paragraph 127 of the National Planning Policy Framework and with policy HE2 of the local plan in terms of its relationship to nearby properties and the need to minimise general disturbance to amenity. The proposal therefore accords with policies HE1 and HE2 of the local plan. This slide shows the relationship. Oh, this, sorry, I think I've missed one. I'm sorry. <clears throat> this, in the summary, the proposal is for the replacement of part of the roof of the existing building. The proposed development would not be harmful to the character or appearance of the conservation area, and there wouldn't be no adverse impact upon the setting of Allendale House. It's therefore recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, according to my list, we don't have any public speakers for this item. Although, uh, as previously mentioned, we have David Morgan, member of the committee, who is a local member, but has um, declared an interest. David, do you wish to speak as local member? Yes, just very briefly, uh, Madam Chairman, which is 
a very rare thing. Um, yeah, the Allendale Centre roof has been in need of repair for quite some time. Um, but uh, last year or the beginning of last year and certainly the year before 2019, there was slight uh, improvements done within the Allendale Centre itself. Uh, and um, shortly afterwards, due to a very heavy rain shower, um, part of it was uh, was spoilt and the decoration because the roof has, as I say, leaked for quite some time, uh, especially in the main hall. And it was fortunate that when we did have this terrific rainstorm, part of the internal tiles had come down uh, and it was just as well that the improvement team um, was there doing work and so they were able to deal with the situation so basically yes it, it's uh, it, it does need a new roof uh, and um, certainly it will uh, any work that goes on inside will then be protected um, I've been associated with the Allendale Centre since it was built believe it or not in 1975 so uh, it's uh, it, it's done well but uh, it's certainly uh, a, a roof which is slightly pitched would be a big help. The problem is at the moment it's been a flat roof uh, and of course um, consequently as flat roofs do they uh, do begin to leak in time. So uh, from everybody's point of view especially the Allendale Centre having a new pitched roof would be uh, would be the final uh, icing on the cake as it were Madam Chairman. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I will ask a question. I'm not sure that we need anything, but is there anything officers want to come back on following the local member? Uh, Kim Cowell here, Madam okay. Chairman. No, there's nothing, nothing to add. Lovely, thank you. In that case, I will move on to my speakers and my first speaker this morning is Barry Gorringe. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I do have a question first. Um, in the agenda, point 2.4, it says about two new windows on uh, are proposed at a high level to the front of the building. No mention was made of that in the presentation. Caroline Smith here. Um, there are two windows shown above the front entrance within the, the roof, but they're at a high level. Um, yeah. So are, are we saying then that um, as well as um, replacing the old roof for a new roof, we're also replacing these windows as well? Um, the, these windows are shown on the plans as part of the replacement roof. Yes, at, at roof level over above the front entrance on the south elevation of the building. OK, right. Well, um, I know this building quite well because it was um, we were operating there um, when we were East Dorset District Council. So and I, I was there when all the, as Councillor Morgan said, I was there when um, all the internal decoration was done shortly be before we became uh, a unitary. So um, I'm quite happy to recommend, uh, propose recommending the grant. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Barry. Yeah, it seems as though those windows are there for, to let in more light into the reception area. Uh, my next speaker is Robin Cook. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, well, yes, uh, I was going to propose it anyway, but I'm happy to second uh, Councillor Gorringe on that one um, because this is something which is as long, long overdue. Um, and as a regular, fairly regular user of Allendale for many years myself, um, I know just what uh, what a draw it is not just for Wimborne Town, but from a huge area around. So it's a critical part of 
the community of Wimborne, BH21 almost, and wider. So important that we keep it up together. And this is the last piece, I think, in the jigsaw uh, to finish it up to a standard that's uh, really uh, a pleasure to be in and a pleasure to use. So happy to second. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my last speaker is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, just to uh, reiterate what my colleagues have said before me and my ward colleague, Councillor Morgan, as well. Um, this, the repairs to this were sort of got held up by the uh, local government reorganisation, and it's extremely good now that it's come before us that we can actually hopefully finally do the repairs, the structural repairs, because it is causing degradation of the of the building. So I'm happy to support the proposals on the table. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. I have no further speakers, so the officer recommendation is to grant, which has been proposed and seconded. So I will now put it to the vote. Uh, so I'll go through the roll call, please, members. So Shane Bartlett. I have listened to the debate and listened to the officer's presentation and I vote to grant. Thank you. Alex Brenton. Hello, I have been here throughout, listen to the presentation, I know the building and I vote to grant. Thank you. Robin Cook. Uh, yes, I've heard the full presentation and uh, take part in the debate, happy to grant. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Um, yeah, present throughout, heard the presentation and vote to grant. Thank you. Barry Gorringe. Uh, present throughout the um, presentation and the debate and I vote to grant. Thank you. Brian Heatley. I've been present throughout. I've heard the debate and I vote to grant. Thank you. David Morgan has declared a, a prejudicial interest. Julie Robinson. I've listened to the presentation. I fully support and I vote to grant. Thank you. Thank you. David Took. Hi, <coughs> excuse me. I've listened to the presentation. I've been present throughout and I vote to grant. Thank you. Bill Trite. I've listened to the uh, whole procedure and um, I vote to, to grant. Thank you. And John Worth. I've listened to the full presentation and I vote to accept. Thank you. So that sounds to me as though it's unanimous, but I will go to David Northover, please, to confirm the vote. Yes, Chairman, formally 10 for, none against. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. So that is carried. Thank you all very much. So we move on to item six, which is application six. 2020-0013 to erect 17 dwellings, creation of an access and associated parking and landscaping, land at White Lovington, Bay Regis. And that starts on page 29 of your agenda. Uh, and Lexi Donas is going to take us through this one, please. Thank you. We can see the presentation. <laughs> OK, so good morning, members. Um, my name is Lexi Dones and I'm a planning officer in the eastern area of Dorset Council. So this application is to erect 17 houses with associated access, parking and landscaping on the land adjacent to White Lovington in Beer Regis. This application is pre presented to the planning committee following the scheme of delegation referral process. The officer recommendation is approval and objections have been received by the parish council, ward councillor and local residents in relation to the compliance with the Beer Regis neighbourhood plan, design and highway safety. Other objections are set out in pages 35 and 36 of the officer report. So the site is located within the Beer Regis Purbeck area of Dorset, um, as shown here on this plan. Uh, Beer Regis is a sustainable location for new dwellings. 
The settlement benefits from facilities including a post office and a shop, a doctor's, dentist and a primary school. The Beer Regis Neighbourhood Plan, which was adopted in June 2019, allocates land for residential development under policy BR7, which is shown in pink. Uh, this includes the, the land off White Lovington, which is highlighted here with the development site. So the Beer Regis Neighbourhood Plan allocates approximately 12 dwellings on this site. This land allocation does not preclude other windfall residential development. As set out in the officer report, officers do not consider that the development conflicts with the neighbourhood plan and have therefore assessed the application in light of the presumption in favour of sustainable development um, in light of the housing delivery test results. Uh, on the slide, the red star is the approximate location of local services, including a surgery shop and a church. This is a, approximately a half a mile from the proposed development site. So the proposed development site is shown outlined in red here. It is currently agricultural land, which is sometimes used for grazing. Um, on this plan, I've shown the settlement boundary identified by the Perbeck local plan, uh, shaded in blue, and the proposed development site again is the area outlined in red. Um, as shown in the previous map from taken from the Beer Regis neighbourhood plan, this site is allocated for housing. I think it's worth noting that no housing is allocated outside of the blue area on this map. So the settlement boundary is influenced by the 400 metre buffer zone, uh, which is shaded in red. This was introduced by Natural England to protect internationally designated sites. No housing development is allowed or proposed within the red area. Um, so this site is approximately 400 metres from Black Hill Heath, which is a designated triple SI Heath and a Dorset Heath special area of conservation. So the layout of the site has been designed with the settlement boundary and the 400 metre buffer zone in mind. Um, you can see that here. This is the 400 metre buffer zone marked in red. So whilst the Beer Regis neighbourhood plan identified a desire for new areas of open space as part of the proposed residential development, there is no policy requirements for this development of 17 dwellings to secure public open space. Um, however, given the proximity of the site to the designated heathens and the lack of nearby sand provision, Natural England have identified the need for a heathland infrastructure project. So the applicants have suggested the temporary provision of an area of space immediately adjacent to the housing, um, outlined in blue here. This would require planning permission, but in principle could act as an effective mitigation until such time alternative heathland mitigation is secured. It is anticipated that the back lane sand could provide an alternative in the long term. So the provision of a heathland infrastructure project prior to first occupation of any of the dwellings and its maintenance will be secured via a section 106 legal agreement until a time that the council can be satisfied that this is no longer required as heathland mitigation. We could not then require ongoing provision of the public open space under other policies. Um, so the HIP is anticipated to include an informal footpath, um, some benches and some bins for dog waste as well. So this is an aerial photograph of the site, which demonstrates the existing boundary vegetation um, of between White Lovington and the proposed site and also around the proposed site area here. So the site is fairly level and benefits from mature screening as shown on the um, aerial photography. This just shows the sort of current use of the land. OK, so the proposals include the erection of 17 houses. There will be 15 two storey dwellings varying in size from two to four bedrooms and two bungalows. The houses are a mixture of detached and semi detached, meaning that 17 houses are provided across the 12 structures. 
The number of dwellings and their sizes are set out in section six of the officer report. The plots marked with the blue dots. Sorry, the plots marked with the blue dots are the proposed bungalows and six units marked with the red dots. Uh, units 10 to 15 inclusively are affordable homes and these homes coupled with their financial contribution will ensure the proposals comply with policy BR6 um, affordable housing of the Beer Regis neighbourhood plan and policy AH affordable housing of the Purbeck local plan part one. As part of the landscaping scheme to be secured by condition six further tree planting will take place to reinforce the boundary with White Lovington. So especially along this line here. So as shown by satellite imagery again, there is a natural boundary around the existing site, um, which is provided by existing vegetation. There is also a further natural boundary around the proposed site. So the houses I've just shown you will be located here and around here. So these photos show existing properties on White Lovington. All are two storey with varying designs. All have off-road parking and substantial frontages. So the neighbourhood plan envisages a continuation of the low density layout of the existing properties, which have a net density of nine dwellings per hectare. Concerns have been raised that 17 dwellings would be contrary to the intentions of the Beer Regis neighbourhood plan but officers consider that the proposals still represent a low density of 13 dwellings per hectare compared to the average density of 30 dwellings per hectare, which is envisaged for development across other allocated sites in the Beer Regis neighbourhood plan. So there are eight different house types proposed across the site. House types six, seven and eight are very similar in terms of design and size to existing properties on White Lovington. They're all detached properties with four bedrooms and a carport. So house type eight will be units four and nine. Um, the arrows show where they are on the proposed site. House type seven is unit three located here. Um, so as you can see, these uh, house types also have rear gardens and landscape frontages. House type six will be units one and two, again located here. I, and again, they are four bedroom detached houses with carports. So house type one is a two bedroom semi detached property. Um, both of these will be affordable housing. Neighbours and the parish council raised concerns regarding the size of some of the dwellings, but it is noted in the Purbeck area of the strategic housing market assessment, um, a greater need for small properties has been identified there. So these are two bedrooms semi-detached and again the arrows show that these will be located here on the site. So house type two is a three bedroom semi-detached property. Um, and again, both of these will be affordable housing. House type three is a three bedroom semi-detached property. And again, both of these will be affordable housing. So you'll have noticed that the external design for house types one, two and three is virtually the same um, as the internal layout and configuration that differs slightly. So house type four is a detached bungalow with a carport and that will be units 16 and 17 located here on the proposed site. Um, they will have three bedrooms. And house type five will be units five, six, seven and eight. Um, these are three bedroom semi detached properties that will be provided on the open market. Um, details of all external and roofing materials will be secured via condition seven uh, prior to their use on the development. So in terms of uh, neighbour amenity, the low density of both the proposed and existing sites, along with existing landscaping, mitigates the impact of the proposals on neighbours. The closest relationship between the proposals and the existing site is here between unit one of the proposed development and existing number 12 White Lovington. 
The side elevation of Unit 1 will be located approximately 12 metres from the side elevation of 12 White Lovington. Um, as you can see here, there is one first floor window proposed on the side elevation of Unit 1. Uh, this window is a small secondary window serving bedroom 4. Given the landscape boundary, the distance and the fact that the window is not a primary out outlook, officers have assessed this relationship to be acceptable. So the neighbour amenity between existing properties 3, 4, 5 and 6 by Livington with the proposed bungalows can be shown here. The distances demarcated by the red arrows are approximately 30 metres, which officers consider is more than sufficient um, to ensure that there is no negative impact on the occupiers of numbers 3 to 6 White Lovington. So there is the potential for a perception of overlooking of the garden of number six from the new units to the southeast from the first floor windows which serve bedrooms. The separation distance of approximately 27 metres building to building and the boundary vegetation are considered sufficient that any harm to neighbour immunity would be limited and would not justify refusal of the application. Again, that distance of 27 metres is the one demarcated here by the red arrow. And again, just to show another relationship between um, numbers, and seven and eight, numbers seven and eight White Livington and the new road, uh, again, that, that distance demarcated by the arrow is approximately 30 metres. And it is worth noting that as part of the landscaping condition, uh, there is a requirement to reinforce some of the boundaries, such as this one here, to ensure the density of the hedgerows and trees. So this shows the existing vehicular access to White Lovington. Um, a number of concerns have been raised by the parish council, neighbours and councillors regarding highway safety concerns and the cumulative impact of proposed development. So the highways officer has assessed the proposals in depth. Um, he's taken into account accident records, speed limits and visibility displays. And he considers the existing junction is more than sufficient to facilitate the additional traffic generated by the development. Um, these objections are noted, but after advice from colleagues, officers do not consider they warrant refusal of the application. So this is the proposed vehicular access point, which is adjacent to existing property 12 White Livington. So the road will, expend, will extend at the current width of approximately five metres. Um, this photograph shows what, what it currently looks like, and this is what's proposed on the plan. So in summary, your officers consider that the application is acceptable in all respects, subject to conditions set out in section 17 of the report and the completion of a section 106 legal agreement to secure heath and mitigation prior to occupation and also affordable housing. So the recommendation is approval or refusal if the section 106 legal agreement is not completed by the 31st of October 2021 or an alternative date agreed by the head of service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, we have Colin Graham from Highways with us at the moment. And is there anything that you wish to say now, or would you rather respond to member questions? Um, I'll happily respond to member questions. Thank you. That's lovely, thank you. OK, if we can now move on to the public representations. Chelsea, good morning. Do you want to take us through those representations, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first comment is from Mr and Mrs Aldous, which this submission has been prepared and discussed by the residents of White Lovington and is submitted with the agreement of all those who signed the request for an extension on the 30th of March. With regard to the planning officer's report and recommendation, we express our disagreement and further concerns as follows. Fundamentally, we believe the planner's judgment that the application is not in conflict with the Bear Regis neighbourhood plan is perverse. Major implications for planners, paras 15.2 to 15.9. 
The Bear Regis Neighbourhood Plan was prepared after a lengthy consultation with all parties and overwhelmingly supported by the residents of the village and the Parish Council. We fully support the Parish Council statement in, in its objections to the current development plan. The unilaterally enlarged development plan offers nothing to the strategic need of the village or county, and yet is being forced upon a quiet residential cul-de-sac, inhabited mainly by retired people, some of whom are seriously disabled, e.g. 28 affordable homes are contained within the Bay Regis neighbourhood plan. Significant benefits would accrue to the developers who fail to live up to their own consultative consultative promises and responsibilities, see BRPC objections, and of all their own volition produced a 17 home plan plainly in conflict with the original Bear Regis neighbourhood plan for 12. We refer to below to my previous letter of object, objection dated 24th February 2020 and urge the committee to re-examine some detailed reality which the planners report downplays throughout. Paris 6 of the Bear Regis Neighbourhood Plan would like to see all 28 affordable homes located on two sites close to the village centre so, so that residents can make use of local shopping and facilities. 72% of the village respondents voted in favour. Paris 6, the accommodation schedule, provides a potential bedroom count of 93 persons, three times the current population of White Lovington. Paris 7, the transport statement, stated the implications on traffic flow are minimal. The consultant's estimate of daily traffic movements of the 17 houses is estimated at only 122 a day. Based on the consultant's formula, a realistic minimum number of residential movements will be 274, plus service vehicles, deliveries, friends, etc. Para 7, the development will turn a quiet cul-de-sac into a through road for houses 10 to 14, significantly, significantly increasing risk and noise. Para 8, Car parking is unrealistic and the plan's report simply refers to 52 impractical rearranged spaces. See Bear Regis neighbourhood plan for current densities and likely growth. Para 9, more than doubling traffic movements and trebling of pedestrian movements will self-evidently increase road safety risks substantially for residents who are most, like, mostly in their 70s rentees. The plan's report, Para 12, equalities duty. What consideration has been given to this duty none shown? Para 15, inadequate description of the objector's concerns. The next comment is from John and Helen Locke, which this submission has been prepared and discussed by the residents of White Lovington and is submitted in agreement with all those who signed the request for an extension. We wish to express our disagreement with the plan officer's recommendation for this application as follows. The plan and officer report, para 15.6 and 15.7, states that the officers consider that the proposal does not conflict with the Bear Regis neighbourhood plan. We disagree and fully endorse the statement of the parish council in this regard. Specifically, the wording, approximately 12 homes, was discussed by the community, agreed with the parish council and voted on by the village. Approximately 12 means pl 12 plus or minus a small number, not a 42% increase. Surely local buy-in is important to achieve a sustainable development. The proposed development will have a significant detrimental impact on the triple SI, with new housing built up to the limit of the 400 metre buffer zone. <clears throat> the main access road running through it with a significant projected flow of traffic of vehicle and pedestrian traffic, the effect will be to marginalise the triple SI boundary. The mitigation offered involves a temporary hip to be developed on site until the proposed sang at back lane on the other side of the village becomes available. The land for the temporary hip, which currently has no public access, will then revert to agricultural use. This seems to be very ad hoc and not consistent with the concept of sustainable development and would benefit more from, from more consultation with the local communica community as indicated by the Parish Council. Power 15.58 of the Plan Officer Report is confusing. The 11 metre by 62 metre area mentioned is an established wood woodland slash copse frequented by wildlife, wildlife. It includes a number of protected trees and with no public access. Is this part of the application? What landscaping is being proposed, and if so, where is the detail? In powers 15.27 to 15.36, the officers have dismissed the concerns of, concerns of residents of White Lovington about the loss of privacy and security resulting from the new road and public access to the rear of the properties. The officers, in a number of places, erroneously refer to the existence of mature trees and hedgerows as mitigation of the noise and disturbance. In fact, many of the ho existing houses in White Lovington have open aspects to the rear with no significant screaming by hedgerows or mature trees. 
the proposed development of housing, access, road and path will result in a significant loss of privacy and security, which has not been addressed adequately. The proposed new road and path layout, drawing 19.1056.003p3, is confusing. Does the new footpath only extend in front of 12, number 12 to 16? We request the committee urge the applicant to engage directly with the parish council and amend the proposal to bring it in line with the neighbourhood plan. The next comment is from Ian Ventham, who's the chairman of Bear Regis Parish Council. Bear Regis completed and adopted by Dorset Council following a local referendum in August 2019 and after full consultation with all statutory consultees and residents. It is very much in favour of development on the White Lovington site. Fair Regis Neighbourhood Plan Policy BR7 Residential Development page 18. However, Fair Regis Parish Council believes this application does not conform with the Fair Regis Neighbourhood Plan in a number of key aspects. Fair Regis Neighbourhood Plan Policy BR7 Residential Development in respect of White Lovington page 18 states land extending to about one hectare, 2.5 acres, approximately 12 homes. We do not consider an increase of 42% in house numbers from 12 to 17 is acceptable. The figure of 12 dwellings was originally put forward by the developer and landowner during the early consultation process and was accepted by Bear Regis Parish Council. The density was confirmed by then the planning authority, Purbeck District Council, as being appropriate and in line with the requirements being included in their local plan. Bear Regis Neighbourhood Plan Development Site, section page 17 states, the White Lovington site should be developed at a lower density than other sites in the Bear Regis Neighbourhood Plan to respect the existing development in the area. And this site is expected to provide around 12 dwellings. We do not consider 17 dwellings to meet this requirement. This section, page 18, further states, White Lovington site should include areas for informal recreation. This application fails to include any such recreational area. In the housing section of the Bear Regis Neighbourhood Plan, page 15, it states clearly that developers need to work closely with BRPC to consider development density before submitting plan applications. Sadly, since the initial consultation which proposed 12 dwellings on this site, the developer has not entered into any discussions despite numerous emails from Bear Regis Parish Council since the plan was adopted in late August 2019, inviting them to consult with us. No response has been received and no indication of the intention to increase the number of dwellings by 42% was has been given. Regarding comments put forward by the developer regarding housing land supply, we can confirm that figures included in the adopted neighbourhood plan were based on the most up-to-date evidence of housing need and not on, not on figures included in, P in PLP1. Consequently, the figures shown in the adopted plan are sound and in our opinion, the arguments put forward by the developer for a higher density of housing are ill-founded. Bear Regis Parish Council believes that the adopted neighbourhood plan should carry considerable weight and needs to be taken seriously when determining plan applications within the plan area, as indeed this committee did when considering another site within Bear Regis some months ago. We would re reiterate that the Parish Council is firmly in favour of development on this site, but request that the developer be asked to submit new plans that are in accordance with the agreed consulted upon and adopted neighbourhood plan. The next comment is from the agent, which is Kat Burdett from Ken Park Planning Consultants. Councillors, the application before you seeks permission for the delivery of one of the housing site allocations within the Bear Regis neighbourhood plan. <clears throat> the site forms part of the council's housing land supply and the principal development of the site has been considered acceptable by an independent plan inspector and by the local plan, local public in passing the plan through referendum to adoption. The site is formally allocated for residential development and has been brought into the settlement boundary. Planning permission should be granted before subject to the consideration of the matters and deta of detailed design and layout. <clears throat> the public highway, White Lovington, is surrounded by an existing pocket of modern residential development. The houses were built in the early 1990s, the result of a series of interle interlinked planning permissions and comprise generous families' homes set over two storeys with well proportioned gardens and off street parking. The applicant is seeking consent to the erection of 17 dwelling houses including the creation of a new access and associated landscape and parking, arranged with a new, about a new estate road which snakes through the site and features several changes in surfacing, broken up with stone sets in order to both control vehicular speeds and provide some variation to reduce the perceived amount of hard surfacing. 
The scheme as proposed is heavily landscaped with properties featuring large rear gardens and modest front gardens and incorporating both of all the existing trees and allowing for new planting. Sufficient buffers have been provided to existing trees in order to ensure there is no future pressure to prune or fell resulting from the development. The, dwe the dwellings have been carefully detailed and articulated to provide interest through changing in materials and the design and the form of dwellings. The dwellings have been individually designed as opposed to clients on a more uniform house type to ensure they respond positively to their particular setting on the site and relationship with other dwellings. Separation distances to existing dwellings at White Lovington are substantial. The proposals will deliver six affordable dwellings, all of affordable rented tenure and a commuted sum contribution for a percentage of a unit to deliver a full policy com compliant 35% affordable housing provision. The development will see mitigation land in the form of Heathland Infrastructure Project, HIP, secured immediately to the southeast of the site, which will provide space for dog walking and general recreation to reduce pressure upon protected designations of the Dorset Heathlands. This land will be secured by the way of a Section 106 legal agreement. The, the proposal also seeks to deliver pedestrian improvements to White Lovington, comprising the creation of additional footway to link the site with the existing footway and promote sustainable methods of transport. There are clear benefits arising from the development. The development will not impact on the neighbouring residential properties and there are no objections from technical consultees to proposals. The presumption in favour of sustainable development applies and there are no issues with, which significantly or demonstrably outweigh the debt presumption in favour of the grant of permission. I ask neighbor, members to support that officer's recommendation and vote for approval. That's all the comments. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Chelsea. That felt like a bit of a marathon. Well done. Um, we have two local ward members, Peter Wolf and Laura Miller, who were both invited to speak but have not um, accepted the invitation and neither of them are in the meeting. So before I move on to the members, officers, are there any responses that you wish to make in respect of any of the public representations? Thank you, Chair Liz Adams here. Um, I've worked with Lexi on this application. Uh, I just wanted morning. to re thank you. I just wanted to reassure members that that we do take the Bear Regis neighbourhood plan very seriously. It's obviously um, it very important in determining any applications within this neighbourhood, and uh, we have carefully considered how the application aligns or doesn't align with the neighbourhood plan, including discussion with our colleagues in policy planning who were involved in the formation of the neighbourhood plan. And they have advised us that because the the way that um, the neighbourhood plan policies are written, that approximately 12 in this case um, means that there is no upper limit and the um, the assessment to be made is whether the proposal and the, the um, number of houses proposed fits with the character of the area, which was the intention of the policy to have a lower density to respect existing development in the area. So um, in this case, yes, it is 17 houses. That is obviously a 42% as has been mentioned increase on the 12. However, when we look at how that fits on the site and um, the actual density is still very low compared to the usual 30 dwellings per hectare that would be anticipated. So that's um, one point. Um, there was mention in the representations about affordable housing being provided elsewhere in Bear, um, Bear Regis, but actually um, the policy requires that development sites will be expected to deliver 40% affordable housing. That is BR6 of the neighbourhood plan. And um, the perfect local plan obviously advises that they should be on site. It's much better to secure a mix of houses on site to secure a sustainable development. Um, there's obviously been concern about the number of people um, using the, the highway and I'll leave Colin to speak about that but from um, officers point of view we have considered the equalities duty um, in the consideration of this application. Um, age and disability are obviously protected characteristics and there is the potential for this development to impact more 
on people who are older, people who are infirm, uh, since they'd be less likely to be able to leave the houses during construction and they may be more affected if they're trying to cross the road and there's more traffic, those kind of aspects. However, officers haven't identified negative impacts on groups with protected characteristics that would outweigh the benefits of the proposal and the proposal is noted includes two single storey dwellings which are suited to those with mobility issues as well as the family housing that, that Lexi set out. Um, in respect of the there was a question about the open space I don't know if Lexi is able to share the, the slides again um, there was a question about the existing sort of cops and how that was going to whether that was part of the application site. Um, the, the confirmation is yes, it, it is part of the application site. It's an area of trees. Thank you, Lexi. Um, to the north opposite units one, two and three. And that is um, intended to remain as trees and to maybe have some additional planting. And that would be secured via the condition that is before you. Um, and so there were lots of different issues raised weren't there i think probably those are the main ones and no doubt um members will, will wish to to ask other questions thank you thank you very much liz i have got members queuing up with questions already so uh, colin did you want to respond to any of the public comments or are you happy to wait for members questions um I, well, yeah, I'll wait till members' questions. I can take all in one go, or I couldn't head them off at the pass now. If, <laughs> if, 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 if my answer uh, did not that. being a clairvoyant, I think we'll see what they have to say. Yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So, my first speaker then is Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. I didn't think I'd be first. Um, on, could we have another look at the? the site plan. I am interested uh, because I know this area very well. Um, how the pedestrian access to the C6 operates. There is a, a, um, a zebra crossing which crosses uh, Rye Hill and goes to we used to go to the old school, uh, but it also goes to pavements. I'm just thinking that if all those houses that sort of back on to the C6 are going to try and break out through their back gardens and make informal access to the um, to the road rather than walk all the way round. Is there actually a sort of a set footpath through to the zebra crossing? Um, because if there isn't, there should be. Uh, because above the zebra crossing, uh, the bank and the trees are quite steep and you don't really want people shuffling down that bank uh, because it isn't a footpath at that point. Could I have a bit of clarification on that? That would be my question. Thank you. OK, I think that, that deserves an immediate answer, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, through you, Chair. There is not a direct access through there. Um, it's the, the school is no longer operational there. That, that moved away. The zebra crossing, um, it wouldn't actually meet current requirements. If you did a count on it, a, 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 a pedestrians times vehicles uh, count on there, it was only justified because the school was there. So the main attractors are all to the, um, all within the village to the, to the north. So we felt it but more pertinent to keep pedestrians coming out of White Lovington. Um, for the odd few that wish to walk um, to the south, um, they could still do that uh, using White Lovington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you want to come back on that answer? I sort of do because um, Beerages is very, I mean, because it is, you know, a semi rural village, it is very popular with dog walkers and we have children with bikes. And I know they all go up to Black Heath, Black Hill, which is to the south of this site at the uh, at the brow of the hill. And we and I can just see people cutting through their back gardens to that road uh, to assume everybody who leaves their house will sort of walk all the way around through White Lovington and down to the bottom seems a bit unnecessary. The fact that there is a, a zebra crossing and there is a pavement on the other side of the road 
going south, going up the hill, um, seems to me that to, to link it together would make it much more of a sustainable traffic situation. If you wanted to cycle from one of these houses to Wareham, you would actually probably, you know, cut through and, and go straight on rather than adding several hundred yards to your trip. Um, I just sort of think we might as well link this place up so that it actually links with Black Hill, which is a major dog walking area, that it links with um, the rest of Rye Hill. Otherwise, it is sort of upper, you know, a long dog leg and it just encourages people to get in their cars again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Brian Heatley, you are next to speak, please. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and I very much agree with what Councillor Brenton has just said. I know that area. Um, I want to see whether I've got the logic of this right, because it seems to me that the crux of the issue is whether we think this uh, development conflicts with the neighbourhood plan or not. If we think it does not conflict with the neighbourhood plan, then we are directed to the situation in, I think it's paragraph 11 of the MPPF, which basically says we've got to have very, very, very serious reasons to reject it. If we think it does conflict with the neighbourhood plan, then we're looking at paragraph 14 of the NPPF, where there's a list of conditions you have to meet, and I think paragraph 15.3 of the officer's report says all those conditions are satisfied and so in that case we're pretty much encouraged to conclude that the adverse impact of allowing development is likely to significantly demonstrably outweigh the benefits. So we're pretty much encouraged by paragraph 14 if we think it conflicts with the neighbourhood plan to reject it. Now, have I got that logic right or have I got it wrong somewhere? Liz, do you want to come back on that, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Heatley, you have it correct. Thank you. <laughs> we'll come back on the substance of uh, whether it conflicts or not in a minute. <laughs> yeah, is there anything Anything else that you wish to say at this point? Not at this point, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My next speaker is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's, it's a question surrounding highways. I just wondered why um, the access to this site isn't being done from the Rye Hill. Um, that was that was not um, proposed, and the um, it was looked at. But the, I think the, the gradients, I'm trying to recollect it, it's a couple of years back now, the gradients were quite severe around there. Um, and White Lovington, you can see, you can see from the layout of White Lovington with the cul-de-sac, it was all set up ready for the highway to extend into the site. So that's why the developer chose it. And that's why we naturally looked at it and the gradients suited it. And White Lovington's only got 17 houses on it. That's really, really a very low amount. Um, the junction onto the highway is excellent and we've got really good visibility there. It's um, over 80 metres both directions, so it's well in excess of what's required 43 metres for a 30 mile an hour road. Um, the accident history on it onto the Southfoot Road is, well, it's not, I think the nearest accident was, um, it was about 150 metres away. Um, I just I did look to update myself this morning this morning and it's over 311 metres away is the nearest one in the last five years. Um, so Southfoot Road is a good spot to bring them out on. So okay. it's best to stick with that. Thank you. OK, thank you. I have another question, Madam Chairman. Yep, carry on. OK, um, in terms of the Heathland mitigation part of this site, um, the officers have said it's a, temp a temporary measure. Um, I just wonder whether this involves a specific time frame or is it open ended? 
and I appreciate the fact that as things stand at the moment, it, it wouldn't be possible to develop that site due to the 400 metre buffer area, but of course not knowing what's going to be happening in the future. I just wondered how secure the officers consider that um, Heathland mitigation site as a temporary status is. Through you, Chair. So we need some mitigation because of the proximity of the development to the, the Heathland. Um, usually beyond 400 metres, uh, developments would rely on the uh, mitigation provision through the SIL um, community infrastructure levy. But in this case, because it is in such close proximity to the 400 metres, Natural England have asked, taken the precautionary approach and have asked that um, additional mitigation is secured. Um, mainly this is because at the moment there is no a strategic sang in the locality which they can rely on for mitigation so just relying on the sill wouldn't be enough the developer has proposed that they provide a temporary heat and infrastructure project which um, was shown on the slide um, to as an interim measure so that they can demonstrate that the development will not have harm on the heathland and um, that in temporary measure will need to endure until such time as they can demonstrate that it's no longer necessary for instance because the back lane sang has been provided and natural england are satisfied that that has sufficient um, capacity to be able to accommodate the development in this locality um, so it is open-ended and because it needs to be until such time that alternative mitigation is secured so the intention is that uh, an undertaking would be made through the Section 186 legal agreement that um, the, sang, uh, the HIP sorry, would be secured until such time that the council as the appropriate assessor can be satisfied that it's no longer needed. OK, and, and through you, Madam Chairman, it would be difficult then to develop that site, that part of the site. Uh, through you, Chair. This part of the site is very unlikely to be developed because of its proximity to Dorset Heathland. Thank you. Thank you. I've got another one, Madam Chairman. Keep going. Thank you. Um, on page page 48 of the report um, at 15.45, uh, we talk about the uh, the developers having to provide adequate assurance over the lifetime maintenance of the soakaways. So I just like to know if officers are confident um, in, in terms of the flood impact that this is going to be dealt with. It also refers to obviously the fact that this is a site that does have some surface water um, flooding problems and there has to be an assurance um, by the developer that the foul water drainage cannot be contaminated with surface water drainage on the site. And I, I know that um, these are things that often are done with by officers uh, outside of this meeting. Can I just have an assurance from the officers that they're confident that this can be accommodated on this development site? Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Bartlett, um, officers are confident that um, with the correct conditions in place, this could be achieved. OK, thank you. OK, Madam Chairman, um, I'm happy. Oh, you have another question now. You were going to say something? I, I was going to say, Madam Chairman, on, on the basis of the answers that I've received, then um, I'm happy to propose to go with the officer's recommendation for this development.